Blog Talk Radio. <laughs> Alternative facts. The following message is transmitted at the request of the United States government. At 12.07 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, numerous unidentified objects of unknown intent and unknown origin were detected at high altitudes over multiple locations of Earth's outer space by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and these objects are presumed to be some form of controlled aircraft. It is not known if more of these aircraft will arrive or if they will attempt entering Earth's atmosphere. United States citizens are encouraged to monitor local media outlets as more updates will follow as information becomes available. is transmitted at the request of the United States government. Attacks by the undead have been reported in several states across the country. The dead are rising from their graves and are attacking the human race. At this time, it is expected that more attacks of this nature will occur in several other states in the next few hours. The intent behind the attack is unknown at this time. He has been observed that a bike for exchange of fluids is a method of transmission. This is an extremely dangerous situation if they crave the taste of human flesh. It is not known whether this event will last for hours, days, or even longer. Stay calm as authorities have been dispatched to deal with these creatures. An all-clear siren will be sounded when this situation is under control. Your host, Rodney, the Viking Shortridge, wants to give a big old shout out to the Facebook paranormal groups that allow us to post our shows on their pages and helping us to get the word out about all of our guests. If anyone would like to speak to Black Diamond Paranormal Society, BDPS, to discuss your paranormal questions or issues, go to our website at blackdiamondps.org or email blackdiamondps at yahoo.com. As always, our services are free. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. You can listen in by calling 516-387-1922, or you can go to the Vibe Radio Network website at blogtalkradio.com forward slash Vibe Radio Network. For deep within the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for listening to Within the Chaos. My name is Rodney Shortridge, and I'll be your host tonight. First off, I'd like to give a shout-out to my cousins up in Ohio. Jennifer and Joe Shortridge of 222 Paranormal. If you get a chance, check out their talk show, 
You can find them on Facebook under 222 Paranormal. Have your devices just randomly stopped working? Are you having IT trouble? Not to worry, Mead's PC repair shop can help. We also offer IT support too, including website hosting. We are now also offering full event management services. To find out more, contact our friendly customer service team who will gladly help in any situation. Just call 276-880-8900 or if you prefer, you can stop by our shop at 1089 St. Clair Street, Oakwood, Virginia, 24631 by appointment only or by visiting the website at meadspcshop.com for more information. Thank you. Fandom Fest 2019 is hosted and sponsored by Black Diamond Paranormal Society, Blog Talk Radio within the Chaos and Elk Garden School Community Ministry. The Phantom Fest is geared for the like-minded and enthusiasts and researchers in the fields of the paranormal, UFOs, cryptozoology, comics, horror films, gamers, cosplay, metaphysical, spiritual, artists, authors, ancient civilizations, tattoo artists, unexplained mysteries, superheroes, FX horror artists, steampunk, costume contest, sci-fi and so much more. The Fest offers a unique and interesting outlook on the abnormal. The Phantom Fest will be held on November 2nd, 2019 at the Russell County Conference Center 139, Highland Drive, Lebanon, Virginia. Starting at 10 a.m. and going to 6 p.m. tickets are $7 per person, ages 0 to 6 are free. Four tickets can be reduced to $5 per person with two non-perishable food items to be donated to the Elk Garden School Community Ministry to help families during the Thanksgiving season. Any non-perishable food donations will be happily received. Also, we will have a free costume contest for all ages. Guest speakers, returning this year, Bill and Chris Reap of Reap Investigations, giant researcher Heather Arnold. New to this year's Phantom Fest guest speakers, Dave Spinks, Ron Whitehead, Jake Fife, Chad Zumwalt and Whitney Benson. Amy Green, Barry Gaunt, Cosplay Bridget Baker, CNC Paranormal Investigations, Dennis Estlock, Georges Girls Heather Taylor and Nika Taylor, Haunted MD Donald Molnar, Lucky Bell Camino, Michelle Wagner, and Rebecca Smook. Special appearances by Cosplay Bridget Baker, Martial Arts Christian Yaya Thompson and Token Nihilist Cosplay, Arthur Stump, Grace and Lehman, Raphael Bertiz and the White Bill Ghostbusters. Find us on Facebook Phantom Fest, www.facebook.com slash Phantom Fest. Our website, www.phantomfest.org. Our email, phantomfest1 at yahoo.com. For more information, please contact Rodney Shortridge at 276-970-1456 or Josh Mead at 276-880-8900 extension 1259. Well, howdy, everybody. I hope everybody's ready to settle in for a really amazing show tonight. Uh, tonight, our guest uh, will be Bennett Bonderhide. I hope I said his last name right, because everybody knows I have a hard time with last name. But Bennett acquired the Nomadi uh, Sacred Card figures and engaged in inve- investigative tools honed in his mission as daddy justice to compile information including the connection to the dugon uh he uh, ben speaks and uses ancient alien stones.com to teach of these mystical artifacts inspiring others to connect uh acquire and and active uh their own story well i cannot read tonight i cannot it's just been a long day. It's been a long week. I, I'm sorry, everybody. I just ain't on my game. But I, I'll try. I'll push through. I promise. I'll let him do all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's my honor to welcome uh, uh, Mr. Ben. <laughs> uh, th- uh, thank you for joining me tonight. And please forgive me for tearing everything up. Like I said, I've had a terrible day and terrible week. And I, ho- I hope you can forgive me. 
Hey, well, thank you, Rodney, for having us on the show, and really appreciate the opportunity to tell your circle. And I'm sure to be the uh, for, to have you be the first to introduce them to the Nomoli stones and uh, the whole mystery of the Nomoli. It's quite intriguing. Uh, I, I know I've seen uh, uh, some of your information, and uh, uh, and, and, it, and it intrigued me because I'm. I'm fascinated with the paranormal and anything ancient cultures and so forth. And so uh, I, I think it's going to be a great show. And uh, just if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you get involved with uh, these uh, mystical artifacts? Well, I'm up here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I know you're in the Appalachian Mountains, a beautiful place. Hello to everyone down there and everywhere else. I'm sure you have outreach or as many places in today's technological world. You never know where people are at, but I'm up here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and, and I first came in contact with the Nomali Stones many years ago I, when I was young and on my game. There were a couple of uh, periods of time when I was uh, where there were attempts to recruit me into the intelligence community of the United States, and while I never took up those offers, it just wasn't my calling. Uh, one of the individuals who introduced me to that opportunity was uh, my friend who I remained in touch with because he was just an interesting character, and his name was Bill Diamonds. And uh, your listeners and you may be familiar with uh, with the movie Blood Diamonds. And mm-hmm. Bill would have been the true-to-life character that was depicted dramatically by Leonardo DiCaprio, a uh, essentially a diamond smuggler and uh, again intelligence operative. He was the kind of guy. A shout out to his spirit. He was a real character. He was the kind of guy who, when he found out the best diamonds in the world were in Western Africa, even though it was one of the most dangerous places in the world, he dropped himself in there and went looking for diamonds with a, with a guide and and made friends and got in and out of areas that. Very few people get in and out alive, especially in those days, and uh, came out with diamonds, friends, and long-term contacts. While I was not interested in the diamonds or the uh, subterfuge, I was very interested in the artifacts which were uh, available from deep in the bush in which he had contacts to, whereas others did not. Out of initially a variety of artifacts, wood masks, wood figurines, and the stones. The stones really connected to me. I just uh, really felt a connection to them from the beginning and collected them for many, many years since then. Okay. The interesting thing about Mali that is very unusual is that when we came out a few years ago and decided to connect with other collectors and get out into the world a little bit with them and because uh, I uh, collected them in a bubble, if you will. That's when we found out an amazing thing. My son is uh, 21 years old, Quinn. He's sitting here with me now. He's the technological and the brains behind the operation. <clears throat> and uh, he went online for a couple years and got in front of literally millions of, of uh, other users of computers and and specifically with people that are interested in crystals, ancient stones, figurines, artifacts, ancient civilization, ancient alien theories, and found that, without exception, not one person had ever heard of Nomali stones. I'm guessing, even Rodney, you're up on these things. I'm guessing I can pretty much bet dollars to donuts, as my dad used to say, that you'd never heard of Nomali stones. I'd be willing to, again, bet dollars to donuts that, most, if not every one of your listeners, has never heard of Nomali Stones. In a day when people are very interested in these type of matters, very uh, very amazing, not, su- not surprising and not happenstance, they were purposely suppressed. So you begin to wonder, well, are, are they even real? Are these a real uh, artifact? How could they be a true artifact if nobody knows about them? Well, <clears throat> if you look back in time, which we did begin to research and found that, in fact, they were first discovered by the outside world by Portuguese sailors 
in the 1400s and first written about, published by uh, in Thompson on Africa in 1855 out of New York, and then again in the 1890s, a couple mentions of them in books. In 1917, uh, a gentleman by the name of Walter Edwin did uh, uh, an interesting few pages in his book on No Mali. In the 1950s, many of your listeners, and you may be aware of a gentleman named Thor Heyerdahl with the Contiki. Do you remember? If you're as old as me, we studied that in school. That mm-hmm. was the guy who took off from uh, South America and a boat that was made exactly like they had long ago with no motor, with the same materials, and drifted 5,000 miles to prove that it was likely that the people from South America first discovered Polynesia. There were movies about them, interesting. But anyways, <clears throat> Thor Heyerdahl also was on the first expedition to Easter Island. And in his writings in the 1950s, he identified that small stones, uh, your, view, your listeners again will be familiar with the large stones on Easter Island, but that the small stones found in, in secret caves, there are very few of them, were most similar to the Nomali from West Africa. So he wrote about them. In 1990, there was one piece on a show called Unexplained Mysteries. And then that's when they essentially dropped into obscurity. So they're very unknown, but known. In fact, there's one on exhibit at the Bronx Museum. They have been long collected by the British royalty. They're in the uh, British Museum and other museums around the world. So, uh, And what they are is carved figurines. They're, they're not just blank stones. They're carved figurines, m- carved into soapstone, granite, sometimes uh, uh, sedimentary stone, sandstone, and some perhaps are in meteoric materials. They're only found in West Africa, in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. Okay. Uh, well, what was the first site that you investigated that, that you uh, found these stones or uh, that you actually had uh, first contact with the first stone that you, uh, or carving that you've got? No, they were, uh, I've acquired them through Bill. I was not over there. Uh, Bill would have acquired them from the chiefs, from the shamans, and from the medicine men and medicine women. They would have given him because, uh, for a variety of reasons, because primarily because he was moving diamonds for them, and they would have wanted him to be successful. So they would have given him these figurines as blessings, as protection for his travels, and blessings for his health. You know, there was a time in there when he, you know, he would go. And it was interesting. He'd go in. He'd say he was going for a few months. It might be a year or two till he come out. You know, you never really knew if he was coming out. But uh, in one point in time, he did catch a dysentery. Another couple times, he had malaria. And uh, he also suffered from extreme dehydration. So these are very difficult parts of the world. And uh, the stones would have been given as uh, healing tools to him also. Well, are there any stories that go along with the stones, or and do you, by any chance, know how old the stones are? Well, the answer to that is, uh, first of all, I, I guess I should mention that they primarily are found in the ground. And unlike other stones around the world that are found in temples or burial sites, these are just fi- found randomly buried in the jungle. And they're found near diamonds also often, and diamond deposits. And they are found uh, when farmers clear the land. And as far as how old they are, the, the ones that were, the one that was uncovered by Angelo Petoni, they did do carbon testing on that strata and identified that as uh, 17,000 years old. 
Right. Oh. So the, there's conjecture that they are even older than that. Some people believe in ancient civilizations from that area. So they're buried in the ground. What are, what do they depict? Are the stories the Nomali were gods that were said to have lived in the heavens and misbehaved, and as punishment for their misbehavior, their entire section of the heavens was turned to stone. And they were turned to stone, and they rained down and lived with humans. They were called men of stone, gods of stone, much like if Iron Man came down. You know, long ago they would think he was a being of stone. They were large, had protruding eyes, loud projected voices, and uh, and they blessed the people with... Uh, all that they could in knowledge and and tools and they were said to have given the Nomali stones, the original Nomali stones, the authentic ones the natives would say were not carved by humans but were gifted to them long ago by the Nomali gods for the purposes of uh, healing, for prosperity for victory for peace for justice, for many different things, fertility, of course, and um, and would have been well, used in ceremonies for such. Mm-hmm. Well, are there any like tool marks uh, on the carvings that would make it, you know, uh, that would show that they were man-made? Some of them do have tool marks, yes. Okay. Others do not seem to have. Uh, easily discernible tool marks. Okay. Well, I, I know where I hadn't heard of these stones before, and I'm sure, like you said, a lot of people haven't. Uh, why do you think that uh, the stones have seemed to be purposely being suppressed, you know, from the public? Well, primarily because they come from West Africa is, is one major problem that uh, there's, they have been unknown. They've, they're buried in the ground, so they were unknown for long periods of time. When they've been dug up, particularly in these parts of West Africa, there's a heavy, heavy Muslimization. The Muslims who are in that area are the radical Muslims. They're not ones who accept other people's beliefs. They are the ones who smash museum pieces and would smash these stones and hurt people who would be using the traditional um, arts, more so politically. In countries like that, politic, there's no separation between politics and religion or the businesses, you know, the successful business people. All those would be connected through the Muslim belief and through another strong desire to not be viewed as uncivilized, as primitive. It is very, very important to those who are everything from academics to politicians to scientists and educators and those in medicine, that they distance themselves from all of the healing arts, all of the traditional spiritual beliefs of the tribal practices, because, again, they want to be seen as modern and they want to be seen as civilized. So those combination of things have led to a... And, of course, the overall, there are those who have, for whatever reason, tried to paint many things that come from Africa as dark and of the negative uh, genre, except for some reason if it comes from Egypt that seems to be viewed differently from the world, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, how many stones do you have, and can you explain to everyone uh, what each uh, stone represents. Yeah, we have we have dozens of stones. You can view them on ancientalienstones.com, our website. On there, there's a video of our stones when they were exhibited at the museum, and they can get a, a pretty good feel. The professor and the curator and the director of the museum both speak about the stones. Uh, so they range in designed from those which are depictations of the Nomali gods 
to those which are depictations of normally gods infused with uh, crocodiles, which are uh, affiliated with the normally, to some which are on the other end of the spectrum are fully humanistic and have human uh, images. Uh, they look human in all regards. They would be often used to teach and to instill and to impress the importance of values, such as one we have, which is a mother feeding a child. It would have been used for protection of mothers and children. At the village level, in the center of the village, it would have used that with a bigger one. It would have been used for uh, to help many individuals at once and could have been placed in one person's home also. But that is also for the purpose of reminding all those in the civilization to revere and to protect mothers and children. So, uh, again, they cross over. Now, there are others which we only have come across a few. And uh, I, mean, I should say this, there are just very many diverse styles and images. But there are some which we have only uh, been able to acquire a few which I'm looking at one right now, which have, uh, similar to others you would have seen from around the world, the elongated heads, uh, which are very interesting. Mm -hmm. Some, of course, have attributed that to ancient alien interaction. Mm -hmm. Well, have you found any unusual things about megalithic sites in correlation with the uh, carvings? I don't have any experience with that. I have. Uh, I know that the, um, as far as the megalithic sites, I would say that there is. Would would that fall into the would, uh, the connection to the Egyptian pyramids? Would you consider that something that would be? Yeah, I, yeah, I would. Yeah, the uh, the Nomoli, myself and my son Quinn, were doing research and identified a connection between the Nomoli and the Nomos which are the gods of the Dogon tribe in Mali. And to take that to the next step, the the Dogon tribe are uh, genetically connected to ancient Egyptians. So because of the manner in which science traditionally believes now the narrative which they contend, the thought was that the Dogon came out of the Egyptians. But there are those who contend that Either, <clears throat> excuse me, either Atlantis it was connected to West Africa, or, and or there were civilizations in West Africa in the jungle, which long ago built pyramids, and that they sent people out into Eastern Africa, and that Egypt was a satellite of West Africa. In fact, the book in 1917 by Walter Edwin, the village which he had studied Nomali in, one of their contentions was that when uh, someone passed in in West Africa, they would put a stone on the body for three days and then bring the stone home and it would carry the spirit of the individual. But when someone had gone away, such as to Egypt, and they left the planet, they expired, and they were unable to bring the body back, then they would carve, or they would use, rather, a carving, which they had acquired, and uh, have that theoretically absorb the spirit and bury it in the ground in place of the uh, loved one. One of many theories on why they were buried in the ground. But, again, interesting that they related to the Egyptian, that these uh, that they had sent agents into Egypt to build the first pyramids, which uh, well, I would not have been the first pyramids. The theory is that there were pyramids before that, and that Egypt, again, was the next generation of that. And that these ancient civilizations were reabsorbed into the jungle long ago. Well, are there any astronomical relations to the stones? Well, again, the natives believe that the stones came from this part of the sky that was turned to to stone and rained down, that part of the heavens. 
the one interesting astronomical, I think, connection would be the uh, two things. One, the blue sky stones would be an astronomical collect connection, excuse me, and the fact that their belief was that there was a star in this part of the heaven, and when that turned to stone and rained down, that that is what diamonds are, that they came from that star, which is interesting because no Mali are often found around diamonds. So that's an interesting concept. But then there's the blue sky stone. And uh, Angela Petoni, back in 1990, was in charge of excavation for diamonds in Sierra Leone. And he was looking for diamonds, and he knew that they had reportedly been uh, found with the Mali. So he's asking the chief, he said, if the sky turned to stone and fell down, then you must know where it landed. And the chief says, yes, we do know. And the shaman can take you there. And the shaman took him to a location where he found the blue sky stones on the surface. And then below the surface, he found a large uh, quantity of the blue sky stones configured into the shape of a pyramid, interestingly. So small pieces, many pieces configured and stacked into a pyramid. The blue sky stone, as it turns out, is 77% oxygen. Now, I don't understand that. And don't ask me to try to explain it. But the other interesting thing is the blue coloring is a uh, organic material, but it has been thus far completely unidentifiable. There is nothing else on Earth that has been found that is like it. It is possibly from off the planet. And um, there have never been any other stones like that found in the world, except in this one location in Sierra Leone. Okay. Well, what's your theory on chrome and, and how many of these uh, stones uh, that has chrome? As far as we know, there was only the one. Again, that was the one that was found in the strata that was dated at 17,000 years old. And Angelo Petoni had had, uh, had uh, acquired that stone, and he thought he heard a vibration inside of it. And there was nowhere for anything to be put in it. The stone was solid. It was carved in a stone that which would have been, of course, millions of years old. And the stone itself was stra in strata 17,000 years old. When he extracted well, first he took it and he had it x-rayed, and they identified there was a ball bearing in there, and he had it extracted, and they tested it, I believe in Vienna that was tested, and it came back that it had chromium inside of part as part of the material of that bearing, that ball bearing, which is interesting because chromium wasn't identified until 1761, wasn't isolated until the 1790s by modern man, so... The question would certainly be raised as to how did a chromium ball get inside of a stone and then end, end up in 17,000-year-old strata? Mm -hmm. And I don't have the answer to that. Well, I, I know where I've talked to a lot of people about ancient civilizations. Uh, the serpent is always a common factor. Is the serpent... Uh, relate to any of the stones? Uh, we have no, no stones with, with serpents. I have seen stones with elephants where the nomali is riding on an elephant and the nomali is larger than the elephant, much larger, to demonstrate how big they were. I have seen a stone with turtles turtle is considered the image of the earth, is my understanding from the Dogon. Uh, and but predominantly, we would see them with crocodiles, as we have a couple examples where crocodiles are infused, usually crawling up the back or infused into the front, where the hands are conjoined and merged with the legs of the crocodile. And that is consistent with the nomos of the uh, Mali, the Dogon's gods, which were amphibious gods, the natives 
revere the crocodile because they can live on land and in water, meaning, of course, they're amphibious. And uh, so that was one more connection between the Dogon and the Nomali. Okay. Well, I, you know, I know a lot of authors and researchers, you know, claim the possibility of ancient aliens, and especially with the ancient alien theory uh, that may have helped the evolution of man. What is your opinion about that, especially with the stones that you have? Well, I, I try to pretty much just, uh, we've tried to do research and pass on what we've learned my personal opinion, if, if you would ask, is that, as I've shared before, um, I'm open to all possibilities. I've always been convinced that, that the God, God and the gods want to bless mankind. I'm not one of those who believes that mankind hasn't done anything without somebody teaching them how to do it, that uh, I, I'm a believer in the spirit of mankind and the independence in the fact that we live in a free will zone. But I also uh, am convinced that God provides many opportunities for us to choose to be blessed and many tools that we can use to be blessed. And in my personal experience, it would, it's evident that these stones fall into that category, that they are blessings which were provided, which can be used when... Uh, someone decides to uh, to activate them and to utilize them for the blessings that they have infused within them. Mm-hmm. Now, be that healing, as my friend Shaman Jeff uses them in Florida, or, uh, again, through everything from readings um, to any, any opportunity you could have to utilize something like that. Well, what is the significance of the sites where the stones were found, especially where you, you discussed, you know, uh, uh, they were find, found near diamonds. Are there any other precious uh, stones or metals that these stones were, uh, may have been found that may be some kind of significance to the people of that time? Not that I know of. Diamonds. They're okay. found near diamonds, usually is... Uh what the natives believe and uh, have always contended that they came down with the diamonds from the stars. Okay. Which what is also did? why Bill Diamonds and his individuals that he was connected to would have uncovered them because they were in the diamond mining business mm-hmm. deep in the bush. What did uh, did any of the ancient people live believe any like uh written language or hieroglyphs or petroglyphs also uh, besides with just the, the stones? No, there there's it is not a writing uh, civilization. It okay. is a verbal civilization. In fact there was there were no video or no pictures whatsoever of no Mali in the bush until Earlier this year, we launched and funded an uh, expedition with our agent, who is uh, uh, an operative and a clandestine operative who was able to negotiate and get into the bush and uh, film the first ever images of Nomali in the bush and, in fact, being used by modern tribes, modern tribal leaders and the the modern tribe in uh, rituals and ceremony. Okay. Well, uh, who were the Nomali gods or goddesses? How many gods did they have, and uh, do they still, uh, the tribe still practice or believe into these gods? Yeah, I couldn't tell you how many. I don't know anybody that has ever put a number to them. There are many depictations and artistic renderings. As far as do they still actively use them, it's certainly the more into the cities and the, the areas that are powerfully uh, Muslim, less so. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you get out into the bush, 
from what I personally uh, understand is that when you get more into the uh, deep into the jungle, if you will, then there is emerging and, and all the all the variations in between. But there's emerging where there is a Muslimization and still utilizing the old traditional beliefs because it's hard to, of course, break old patterns. And so there is a conjoining. But over periods of time, it seems like the Muslimization pushes out and continues to try to push out the traditional beliefs until it takes over. And uh, But on the other hand, deep, deep in the bush, it is my understanding that, yes, they are still using them as they have in perpetuity. Well, did uh, did, did they use any like uh, solar alignments uh, or any type of uh, important date that may be uh, engraved on the stones? I know of no engraving indications of those things, um, and I would say this. I would say this, Rowdy. There are. Let's take, for example, um, Sierra Leone. There are 8 million people in Sierra Leone, and the largest city has, uh, you know, 800,000. Over 5 million of those people live in small villages. Many don't have contact with other villages. So what I'm getting at is you know how it is, and, you're in the Appalachian, and I'll bet you you have uh, uh, churches down there who are part of the same faith that are in New Jersey but are completely different in the way they function and how they understand, say, the Bible or or whatever. Down there, they've they got people doing rattlesnakes. Up here, they got people doing something different. But yeah. So it's all uh, – there's so many variations. I wouldn't want to give the indication that I'm going to speak on behalf of all tribes and all practices – I would say they're as varied as the needs of mankind are the the methods in which they use the stones and the uh, uh, the intensity in which they are still used would again be more so the further they are disconnected from civilization. Mm-hmm. Well, that's and that's true. what the Dogon are doing. Well, the Dogon long ago disconnected themselves and uh, isolated themselves so they could keep their beliefs pure and continue to be the conduits between the original source, which is what they believe, and protect themselves from world religions such as Muslimization and uh, and, and the, and the, uh, you know, the radical Christians also, uh, the ones who end up out trying to convert in the jungles are often the ones who are not very... Uh, balance. They're radical, and so they uh, automatically, many people automatically judge anything they don't understand as being evil. And as unfortunate as that is, I'm sure you've seen that in your life, too. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> right? Especially <laughs> in this area. Oh, Lord. Oh, God. Well, are there any stone figures you know, that may have been found throughout the world that may resemble the carvings uh, that you have? Yes, again, the ones in, in that were in Easter Island in the small caves, uh, particularly in the fact they had holes in their heads where ceremonial magic liquid was purportedly put in during the ritual uh, applications long ago. Uh, then my friend Jeff the Shaman, if you look at, uh, we have a video on, uh, again, the ancientalienstones.com. And Jeff has a stone, which is very indistinct compared to most of them, uh, from an artist's rendering perspective. That stone he has had for a year and a half, and he, just a couple of months ago, he said he'd been thinking about it and thought that the image looked uh, familiar. And so he pulled out an old stone he had acquired from someone who had gotten it out of Machu Picchu. And if you look at the video, it's amazing the similarity between the images of the stone from Machu Picchu and the Nomali from West Africa. Oh, that's awesome. 
Yeah, I know it worked. Like I said, where I've had many people on where they've talked about, you know, uh, the building techniques of so many different cultures are so much so so similar that uh, you know they they had to be seafaring people, ancient ancient people. Well, and that was Thor Heyerdahl uh, from the Contiki. His primary result of his work, as he saw it, was to demonstrate that the ancients did not see the waterways as hazard and as an obstacle, but rather as a thoroughfare, which mm -hmm. they freely uh, cruised around the world, much more than we anticipate. Oh, yeah, I agree. Well, what is your opinion about uh, a great cataclysm that happened 12,000 years ago, you know, because humans have lost knowledge to build you know, especially these megalithic sites and, and uh, stone figures like you have. Yeah, I know that there are, uh, it's not something I've made a study of, but I know there are those who, who are contend that there was some uh, cataclysmic event and again, the Atlantean con concepts and that sometimes I've heard people fall between 13 and 17,000 years ago. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I understand some people feel there was a Earth event, a climatic event. Others feel it could have been meteoric. Uh, again, I'm not an expert in those areas. I'm more interested, when it comes down to it, uh, I'm interested in these stones. I'm really kind of just a, uh, because I, what I found was that since no one else knows about them, you know what happens then, Rodney, just like you with your show, you find something that nobody else knows about, and you want to tell people about it. Because if you don't, they'll never hear about it. And so I'm really kind of focused on that. We're looking, we're putting together a television program. We're putting, we're making a few stones from our collection available to be acquired by healers, by paranormals, by psychics, by scientists, who we can then follow on film and document the impact of these artifacts on people's lives real time right now. And uh, that's what I find exciting. I like co uh, conjecture and theorization, et cetera, but I'm, I'm more of a rubber meets the road. I'm interested in, in being part of a new movement where we take artifacts off the museum shelves and reactivate them and put them to use helping people the way they were initially designed to be used. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, they were, when our stones were at the museum, one of the difficult things was I'd be down there and a small child would say, can I touch that? And, of course, the museum director would say no. And I felt like picking it up and handing it to him, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, I agree. You know, you, you want to touch it? Yeah, touch it. We connect by touching and smelling and so using their senses. Yeah, if that child wanted – now, in fact, actually, if it was a child, I would not because no Molly are very powerful spirits. So uh, only a few of them would I allow a child to touch. That's one of the things I was instructed uh, from the bush long ago. And, uh, you know, also certain individuals, you wouldn't want to touch certain stones if they're, they don't appear to be stable and uh, perhaps could not handle the in input, whereas other stones would be more calming and you would put one of those in their hands, not necessarily one that's for energizing someone if they're, uh, overly anxious and overly excitable. So, um, but anyway. Well, do you think, or is it possible that the stones, you know, could uh, open maybe some type of portals or stargate or something like that? Uh, what kind well, of... Well, I'm really interested to see. I'm interested in the scientific evaluations. We know we just were on a podcast with some guys out of Canada yesterday, and the one gentleman said, if you send a stone over, I will eat uh, psilocybin mushrooms on the air, uh, touch the stone, and tell you what messages I get. Now, I think that's going to be really cool. We're going to do that. Uh, wow. There are those who, trans, who do communicate with uh, other, spe other uh, energies, other, uh, if you will, dimensions. I'm more than interested in putting them in a room, putting cameras on them, special sensitive cameras. They have really neat cameras that pick up energies now that were never available before. 
and see what happens. Oh, I had a great experience. Well, we I know, I know that you... we've got edge on it because we've already handed them to numerous uh, shamans, psychics, Reiki masters, stone whispers, as I call them, and we've seen the results. And so now we already are confident that when we put the cameras on and and get the people who are the leaders in their modality to activate the stones, that we're going to just really be excited with the results. Oh, yeah. Well, is there any evidence of the, uh, how the locals uh, uh, use uh, the stones in their ritual? Some, yes. Yeah, some some we would know of uh, from my friend Professor Kwakua Foyanza. Some, when they came from the bush, they would have information, and uh, yeah, they would. There would be some that would be used by individuals, some that were used by tribes, and some that were used by very large uh, tribes. If you will, now when you think of tribes, you know, when I was a young man, we had Tarzan. It was a great show. I watched it on Saturday afternoons on one of the three TV channels that there were back then, before there were 7,000 podcasters in a given moment. But anyway, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we had uh, <laughs> have a lot more choices now. And, you know, we always had this vision of uh, villages with a few hundred people. Well, villages in West Africa can, can have 100,000 people out in the jungle. And... So when they would skin or install a new chief, it would be a very big event. And the why I mention that is I do have one stone that we know was used. It's the largest stone that I've ever seen that um, that was used for the installment of a new chief. It would have been set up a shrine, and people would have lined up in a procession that could have lasted weeks just to touch that stone for seconds and have it bless them and bless it and bless the new chief. Wow. So you'd have those. You would have others that are used for uh, protection that would be put in, uh, in on a shrine in, or in a sacred place in the home, some that would be used with, uh, with drums and music. Others would be used with libations would be poured over them, oils, and... Uh, these, some of these ceremonies would take days on end or would uh, occur over days on end. Well, I know you mentioned elongated uh, uh, skulls. Uh, is there any evidence of the locals using the process uh, to make themselves have elongated skulls? You know, I, I, I've seen no evidence of that in that area. In that region that I know of I wonder where they got the idea from Peru <laughs> Yeah interesting isn't it I mean we didn't see any elongated skulls in that area I think there were other parts of Africa Where they had But uh, I don't believe we saw any evidence of The uh, changing of the skull shape In the Sierra Leone or Liberia or Guinea yeah, it's interesting what I'm looking at right now. Almost looks like he has a helmet on too, like a like he could be a, a astronaut, you know. Oh wow! Well, what is the connection with the uh, Dugon tribe? Well, again, the Dogon tribe um, is from Mali, and so my son and I were doing research. We found out that the Mali Empire back in the twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundreds was extended into the areas where the Nomali are found. And then we identified that the Nomal, the Dogon, they're well known because they were reportedly able to identify Sirius B and Sirius C, the ghost stars of Sirius, long ago, long before science was able to find them before modern man could find them with telescopes. They had already identified these stars, and they claimed that long ago the Nomos gods came down from the heavens in a whirlwind of fire 
and smoke and thunder. And they came down and they were amphibious gray beings. And they imparted the knowledge to the Dogon that mankind had originated on the third planet off of these serious ghost stars. And um, they were the ones who blessed the Dogon with the gifts that they they were instilled with. So what my son and I in our research identified was that they were the Nomos, and they were from Mali. So linguistically, it made sense that they would have been called the Nomos of Mali, and over time, that would be shortened to Nomali. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, does West Africa have any high reports of UFO sightings, and are they any reports of any contact or alien abductions in that area? Well, there would be. Um, I don't know how to answer that except this way. One, the chiefs and those who, from what I understand, who who my people in contact with would contend that there are gods from the skies who have long visited humans and are still visiting humans. They would think that if you didn't know that, you were just uninformed. That would be common knowledge amongst many in tribal. So I would I'd give it to you this way. If you're out in the middle of West Africa and you see a spaceship come and and take away your friend, um, who do you report it to? That's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> That's a good point. You're, you're in the jungle. You, got, you can't pick up your cell phone and call 911. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the tribal beliefs are that these that the gods are uh, are from, from the skies and that they have visited and they continue to visit. And yeah, there was one of the more, at MUFON, one of the uh, presenters and one of the more, uh, one of the newer, more popular uh, stories that's being out now is of a visit that was, I think, 20 years ago. I'm not sure if it was in Kenya, I forget, but uh, there were many children who saw a, a UFO in, in Africa, and they're now coming out, and that's uh, a, a new event or a cover, an event that's being covered newly. And so I can't at- attest to the number because, again, you know, if, if a, a spaceship flies over New Jersey, there will be 10,000 phone calls. If a mm-hmm. spaceship flies over Sierra Leone, uh, no phone calls. No phone calls, yeah, okay. That's no a good point. point. I, I, I feel kind of... Stupid asking the question now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. But the dynamics of it, I mean, we just don't really understand how, 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 uh, you know, how vast the jungle is and how many people are living there. And, uh, you know, truly in the old and like they did long ago. Wow. Well, does the stones measure any type of energy output that can be measured? And if so, what type of equipment was used and the type of measurements, uh, you know, that was received? Good question. I haven't done it yet. Looking forward to finding the right people to do that for us and uh, and do that on film. Well, yeah, that'd be a great I understand I have uh, spoke to one gentleman who has an infrared cameras. Then my... Other friend has was working with a paranormal team, which has a new type of camera that picks up energies, and I've seen some of the results of the, and it picks up the energies and then puts dots and then draws lines between them, and you can see figures moving around. It's quite impressive. So I'm not up on the the most advanced technology, but we are certainly welcoming and uh, inviting anyone with the most advanced technology to get involved. Okay. Well, has the stones affected you or other people uh, that you, that that have encountered them, uh, such as, you know, physically, mentally, and spiritually? I know you were talking about 
uh, 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 I think a psychic, uh, uh, picking up some kind of uh, images from them. On, uh, yeah, we've on, had stone whispers, uh, what I call them, uh, who put the, the stones in their hands and pick up images of times, and they'll date it as far back as hundreds of thousands of years ago. They will tell of images of of natives dancing and colored headdresses seems to be a very consistent uh, note that they'll make as extreme headdresses. And um, others who will pick up what the stone is designed to utilize, to be utilized for. But to answer your question, yes, I have witnessed that those who have acquired stones have had a profound impact on their lives including physical healing, including uh, mental and emotional balance, and uh, and then those in the scientific community. I have one stone was acquired by a professor who's the foremost expert in the study of nanoparticles and neutrinos, and uh, that professor felt like the stone was involved and part of that research. As much as it was perhaps a receiver. Oh wow! Well, I know you mentioned very neat woman. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I I know you was uh, talking earlier about working with a uh, to do a I think TV show or something. Uh, can you uh, discuss a little more about that? You know, who you, you know, if you, if you can, because I know a lot of times they have a, these contracts to kind of keep you hush hush about it. But uh... oh yeah, they're more secret than spies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, the very cloak and dagger about their TV shows and and <laughs> yeah, we uh, the. The plan is to develop a television program. Initially, eventually, we'll do a full-length feature film. Right now, we're in development of a, again, a television series. We have connected with a couple of uh, very successful and prominent production companies, and we are working with uh, in communication with one network right now, a uh, national network that is interested in potentially airing the television show, and. It'll follow the Nomali from uh, when they, the, the history, the traditional beliefs, and we'll depict, let's say we'll, we'll follow a stone and we'll show the Nomali gods giving it to the natives. We will then do a um, reenactment, a dramatization of the, the natives using it, what they would have used it for, how they use it. Then we may show... Bill acquiring it in the in the in the bush, and then we'll follow it to today, and we will go to the real world, and we will show that stone being used by whomever has acquired it in the function that they perform, and uh, and that will be the show. So it'll also be introducing some very interesting modalities. <laughs> Okay. Are you there? Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm here. I, I, Google and their pop up. I've got pop ups blocked, but they still pop up. I don't okay. know how. I like to smack Google in the mouth. <laughs> 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 but here, have, every every week I'm having a conversation. I have one or two pop ups, and everybody's like, "What? What? What? Is that it?" <laughs> There it is. Google's in the power of Google. Is it power of Google? Yeah, I constantly want to advertise. I've I've even had my tech guy look at it, and he he went in, he he searched, and he's like, "You've got everything off. I don't know why you're still getting them." I'm like, "I don't either, but it's aggravating me to death." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, do the tribes of these areas where these stones were found? Do they want the stones back? I mean, have have you had any of, of the tribals going, you know, hey, return our, our, our stones to us? No, there's been no interest in repatriation, if you would call it such. Okay. More so what I have found from 
my personal experience, they're very, very happy to find that we are presenting these stones in a positive manner to people and that we're letting people know that they're valuable, that they're, they're blessings. And they, they feel like that's a reflection on them. They uh, are very happy to see that happen. And they also understand that the, um, it's, it can be dangerous over there to have these stones. And if the Muslims find them, they'll break them. So there mm-hmm. is an interest in seeing them safe. Wow. That, that, that's sad that because of someone's beliefs would try to destroy someone else's beliefs. That's terrible. Very unfortunate, but it's, uh, through the history of mankind we see that, don't we? Exactly. That's the reason why I'm not much on the religion thing. But very unfortunate. Well, I, I'm a believer that there are good people in religion too, but there's always the fanatics out there who seem to take the stage. And and yes, uh, unfortunately, the common denominator seems to be that there are those who believe that they're to use religion to attack other people and to hurt other people instead of to build them up, which is an interesting and a sad way that they live when they believe such things. Exactly. Well, how many but people? We're, happy. Have... we're putting the word out. We're putting the word out and getting something good out there. So we don't really care. We don't much care about those who try to suppress it. We don't care about uh, those who would poo-poo and those who would uh, uh, hate on us. What do we care? We got something cool. We're showing it to people. People who like it, that's good. If you don't, then we don't care. <laughs> Yeah, move on down the line. <laughs> move on down the line, baby. <laughs> what other people think of me is none of my opinion, as they say, right? That's right. I, and I've got a lot of people in my area that think lowly of me, which I don't give a crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I got a song that was one of my favorite ones that probably fits with I Got Friends in Low Places. Mm hmm. <laughs> Garth Brooks, baby. Garth Brooks. Hey. Yeah, great song. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, well, mine there. Yep, I love Garth. He's whew, good old country boy. Well, uh, do you know how many people have one or more of these stones? Original you know, stones. I don't, that- but I, I don't, but I'm like I know you might have listeners out there who have them and don't even know they have one. Uh, there are likely uh, thousands of authentic nomali. We do know that. As I mentioned, Thompson wrote about him in uh, 1855, and it was mentioned that within four years he had a collection of at least ten. So they began to collect them way back then. They were very popular at the turn of the century in the early 1900s. In fact, they were thousands and thousands of fakes, uh, replicas made, that were pushed out on the market and uh, that are available you might, you know, you would find them on eBay for almost no money—a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars. You'll find uh, replicas and ones that are not authentic, but authentic ones again. They've been collected. Uh, I understand the British royalty have a extensive collection, and uh, those who served in the military in West Africa and uh, many uh, you know, admirals, colonels, and would have grabbed them up, and ambassadors and. So they're, you know, they're around, but uh, I don't know of anybody who uh, has any other ones available that are authentic at this mm-hmm. point in time to be acquired other than ours. Well, I, I know earlier you were talking about Sirius B and C. Uh, what is the connection uh, with the stones as far as uh, their gods or uh or what? I, I kind of I was a little confused on that. Yeah, well, the there's no direct connection from the tribal beliefs in Sierra Leone, Liberia, or Guinea that we can find of the Nomali being connected to uh, to Sirius specifically. Um, although there are those, it's kind of circuitous, if you will. I think that's the word. I don't know. But anyways, where in West Africa, my friend Kwaku Forianza, who was born there, tells me that there are men's 
uh, organizations. And those men's organizations practice rituals which are similar and are based on the same gods as Egyptians. And so you've got the Egyptian gods, you've got the Dogon gods, you've got the Nomoli. There is a connection between all of them. The only direct connection between the Sirius is with the Dogon. So it really only by uh, peripherally connects to the Nomali. But they, their contention again was that there was a Sirius B star, which was un- invisible to the naked eye because Sirius A is large and blinds it out. So they contended there was a Sirius B and a Sirius C. Now, we still don't know that there's a Sirius C as far as science. Although perturbations in the elliptical orbits of A and B, as as uh, since 1995, there has been um, uh, conjecture that there is a Sirius C causing the perturbations in the elliptical orbits of A and B. So there may be a C. And on Sirius C, there are planets, and the third planet from Sirius C in, is the one that the Dogon contend mankind came from, that the Nomos brought mankind from there and uh, planted him on the Earth, or at least their derivatives, their ancestors, original. Mm-hmm. Well, what's your opinion on why mainstream media doesn't, you know, cover or report, you know, such findings or the stones that you have? I can't really say that. I don't even. I can't explain why even Ancient Aliens TV show took over three and a half years of convincing them that it was worth reporting. It appears to me, from my personal opinion, that people are uh, kind of stuck on the same things. You know, it's Egypt, it's Machu Picchu, it's Tupoke Kepli, it's just, and they're just regurgitating, it's Easter Island, it's, and it's just, uh, seems to be a regurgitation of the same things over and over again. I don't know if they're concerned about being the first one to come out with something and then being challenged and I don't know if it's a matter of the fact that they're just comfortable producing more and more shows that sell and they give advertisers for, and so they don't have to really think outside the box. Um, I can't answer that. But I know this, it's a great opportunity for guys like you and all these other podcasters and the people out there who do care about new things and have about tired of the 17th person this week going to comp comment on Stonehenge and we're going to see the same pictures of Stonehenge for a half an hour TV show you know, I don't know about you but man it gets older so it's great but you know four more guys say the same thing on Stonehenge doesn't do it for me but these are very exciting it's new they're tangible it's unlike a lot of things which are theoretical and have no uh, tangibility I, I think the interesting thing is we, we we're going to find out where they fit uh, we just don't know yet. Oh, I agree. I know there's all all types of new discoveries and hidden discoveries that no one's reporting on or science or mainstream media or archaeologists kind of push to the side that it, it, it's got to stop. I mean, this tells the story of our, of our past, even though it might be in West Africa, so be it. Uh, mm-hmm. those people are just as important as the people in Egypt or Turkey or wherever. Yes, I think well, you're right. Well, uh, speaking of Ancient Alien Show, uh, what was your experience uh, doing the show? Well, I'll tell you, they're really nice people. The production crew, very helpful, um, very professional. The film guys, easy to work with, and uh, so overall, it was a, a good experience from, from that perspective. I was, you know, since you ask, I was, you know, just disappointed in the long run 
with the lack of interest that they actually had in the Stones, just mm-hmm. personally. And what I mean by that is I reached out to the stars of the show for two or three years. And even after it was on and they all, you know, it's interesting that they all spoke about the Stones, but I know that none of them knew about them before that day. They'd never seen them or heard of them because I've talked to them and, uh, and uh, you know, tried to get interest. But I was just disappointed in their lack of interest in something new and exciting. But I honor them because they have by far brought this subject matter to the attention of more people than any other show before. And they have a great formula. They're just churning out shows and uh, hugely successful. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, gotta honor that. Well, if, if someone has a stone and they would... Uh... Uh, would, would you be interested in speaking to them about the stone or, or purchasing the stone or anything like that? Well, all the stones which I have were acquired out of West Africa and mm-hmm. um, from people that I am very confident are connected to my the connections I made through Bill Diamonds. I would be hesitant and reticent to not to use a word that's too wrong with or too strong, but and I don't want to say contaminate in regards to um, as if it would be lessening them because the stone might be real. But I want I always, as of now, have a collection of artifacts which came from Africa, are authenticated, and um, have demonstrated their their powers and have been museum exhibited. I I would be again reticent to buy stones which may not be authentic. But I would be more than interested in anyone who has a stone that has used it for healing, has any documentation, and uh, would be interested to just talk to anybody about it if they have a stone. Yes, that would be always you know interesting. Any collector is always interested in seeing other people's examples of the you know of a similar stone. They're all unique. What's, what's your opinion about the crystal stones? And uh, what do you think the purposes uh, are the, the, that they were used for? You mean the crystal skulls? Yes. Yeah, that's, again, that's not my uh, area of expertise necessarily. My friend Jeff the Shaman, who's using the Nomali from our collection, he has a couple of crystal skulls, which I was able to Engage in Florida when I was down there. They're valued an ex- extensive amount of money, six figures, I'm sure. And um, he was with the Crystal Skull uh, tour, if you will. So there were three people on the tour, as I recall. There was an anthropologist, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, archaeologist, I believe. There was a, a member of a family of collectors representing their perspectives. And then Jeff spoke about the spiritual purpose and meaning behind the skulls. Again, it's not my area of expertise, so I wouldn't want to say anything that wouldn't be fully accurate, but uh, I know that his contention is that they are here, again, to bless mankind. And that they do have power and that they have influenced and impacted people's lives who have come in contact with them dramatically and positively. Well, here, here's a, here's a fun question I like to ask or or guess. Have you had any experiences, you know, uh, with the paranormal, crypto, or any UFO encounters? Well, um, uh, you're the first person to ask that, and I'm probably going to pass on that question right now. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I'm involved in uh, uh, father's rights, and I'm an investigative reporter. And I should mention that a while ago I testified in a closed hearing on behalf of uh, someone. My primary testimony was to expose a lawyer for committing perjury because my work primarily is 
exposing corrupt uh, judges, cops, lawyers, and and uh, some politicians. Oh, okay. And uh, after I testified, the attorney whom I had uh, impugned and proven that she committed perjury retorted by bringing up my connection to No Molly Stones and stating that I had theories and that I had uh, and that I was uh, my testimony was not credible in this case because of my uh, connection to the ancient alien community if you will and the uh, theories so I'm, I'm reticent again to go into too much that would be inevitably used to discredit my work and would interfere with me being able to help someone and that I might be able to help. Don't feel that. I've been there. I know my granddaughter's mother used me, uh, used me in court uh, against my son because one of my non-beliefs in religion my, where I investigate the paranormal and me hosting the show about. Then, you don't, uh, then I don't have to explain it to you, do I? <laughs> don't have to explain it to me, brother. I know. And the bad thing is, I'm sitting behind the curtain uh, and listening to this, and I can't get up and say anything because if I did, that would hurt my son and hurt my, and my granddaughter. And But when we got out of court, she got an earful. Uh huh. Well, unfortunately, it's a sealed hearing at that point in time, so I was not able to come back in and and uh, you know make some statements, which I would have loved to make to the judge. But yeah, I mean that's the world we live in as of now. So that's when that. I primarily when I talk about the stones, I talk about other people's findings and uh-huh. other people's experiences because. Uh, you know, I can be more objective in that regard anyways. I think it adds more credibility to my work. Well, how supportive is your family with your work, with the Stones and with what what you do? Well, I have uh, six brothers and sisters. So needless to say, you know, they're all different. As far as my work with uh, the investigative reporting, my family and friends all love me, and they've been very concerned that I faced 30 years in prison for bogus charges that have been brought up against me for filming. I've beaten almost all of them pro se. I represent myself pro se. So my family and friends have, and I've been doing that for this, I fell into this work about 17 and a half years ago. So I would answer by saying they all love me, and they really always try to encourage me to quit doing that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> because like me. it's very dangerous. <laughs> but I was facing 10 years in prison because I was actually trying to start a truck driving school here in my county. Can you believe that? Yeah, well, if they target you, they can target you. They don't much have to, you know, they don't have any parameters in which they have to stay once they're they have that power do they well that's that's hey, that's scary that's scary and i even told the judge i said if i'm gonna go to prison for 10 years somebody around here's gonna get hurt there's gonna be a reason why i'm going the judge just laughed and he's like you ain't gonna do a damn thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've worked with uh fathers from virginia west virginia uh, tennessee carolinas and uh you know, they've all gotten railroaded through the system, and uh, it's un- very sad. It's un-American what happens to uh, people. That's, uh, you know, not the subject we're talking about tonight, but it is it is reality, and uh, it's unfortunate if, if it irritates anyone. They don't want to listen to us and turn the radio show off. But, you know, since yeah. you brought it up, I, you know, it is a, a blight upon American history, the the horrible discrimination and destruction of families that has occurred in family courts, and particularly the elimination of fathers. I mean, we have a fatherless America, and they have just destroyed men and their businesses, and they've taken everything from them, and and mostly they've taken their children. And mm-hmm. children need fathers. And as I state whenever I speak, America makes the best fathers in the world. 
and we seem to forget about that sometimes. Mm-hmm. That that's true because I went down that road myself, and and it, the, the scars still. It's been over almost thirty years, and it's still the scars are there. It impacts well, men in America more than any other matter, and it has for decades. More men die in custody courts than are killed by terrorists or gunmen in America. It's just, you know, it's not it dwarfs in comparison. They are just skewered and they are skinned and they are butchered. And uh, there's a immense industry that has grown, and that's what it is. It's an industry that has grown uh, upon the bias against men. And so, you know, that's where that's at. Yeah, that's where it's at. <laughs> I, I mean, we we could mean you could do a show just about talking about that. <laughs> well, I got about the 400 videos that I put together over the last 12 years or 14 years or so, and and uh, we've had quite an impact on a number of cases, and we've helped a number of fathers. We've helped mothers out too. Mostly we help mothers out when they're falsely accused by the government because that's another profit center where they'll come mm-hmm. in and take their children and not want to give them back because some young punk social worker decided that they don't like that mother. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. They take your kids away. And so we've helped mothers, and, and even, you know, Rodney is not going to surprise you. Every once in a while there's a bad guy out there who's the wrong player. But usually not. Usually the poor guys are just schmucks who the first trouble they ever got into in their lives was because they had children and ended up in custody court. That's the truth. they ever did. That was me. I, you know, that's the first time I ever been to court was when my ex, uh, you know, was taking me to court and stuff. She took my kids and everything. And I'm sitting in court scared to death. And my dad's like, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. And then when no, we what? left, I was saying, I said, that was not okay, Dad. He's like, no, it wasn't. I'm sorry. Well, you know, you talk about good old boys. There's that song, She Got the Gold Mine, I Got the Shaft. That's right. <laughs> Jerry Reed. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I'm moving on to these stones, man. This is positive work, and I did my 18 years in the in the war on custody and the war on men, and and now I'm uh, moving over, me and my son, into uh, working with the Stones. And I'll leave that mission to somebody younger. I turned 60 years old, Rodney. I'm too old for that fight world and bozos. I was just in court again yesterday, going around and around with a bunch of, a couple co- cop and a DA. And had a lot of fun. Had her squirming up there on the chair. But, uh, you know, in the end, it's very stressful and irritating, and it's not a lot of fun. Those cops just ain't a lot of fun. Judges just ain't a lot of fun. Lawyers are all real unfriendly. <laughs> as long as you put money in their pocket, they're friendly as hell, but you, you yeah, ain't you got no money. The slot. Yeah, That's it. The slot machine. All right, huh? <laughs> My brother went through that, too. I even told him the lawyer to go to, and he he got mad at me. He said, oh, my God. He said, every time I turn around, they're wanting $1,500. I'm like, I'm yeah, sorry. what we do when I'm taking on the cases over the years, the first thing we do is we help these guys realize their first move is to fire their lawyer, represent <laughs> themselves pro se, get in there and shake it up until they don't want you around anymore, and they'll throw you out. <laughs> yep, that'll do it. That'll do it. <laughs> it's frightening, but you know it's it's worked every time we've had a case so far. Thank God we've been able to uh, prevail. And pull some miracles off, some true miracles, and and uh, yeah, we got a we got one judge knocked off the bench. We got a cop sitting over in a prison cell right now that we followed on our stories. We've got uh, yeah another judge investigated and one of you know like I said, won some cases, keep some guys out of prison that are innocent, and uh, yeah. let some kids have their dads out there. There's a number of kids who have their dads who wouldn't have them. That's all. That's that's great. Well, Ben, it, it's been great talking to you. Uh, what, what's your plans for the rest of 2019? You know, do you have any projects or any shows or anything that you're going to take your stones to? I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Hey, you know what they say? Ben plans and God laughs. laughs. Oh man. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We might uh you know, we'll do any we're, we're, we don't know where we're gonna go. What we know is that we've found here that the stones are attracting some very powerful, very dynamic people. People with good hearts who want to do good things for humanity and, and have an impression and leave a mark. And so that's really, we're going to just kind of let that direct us. The stones are are, are, are the tool, and, and uh, you know, I'm a steward, my son's a steward, and we're going to kind of go where they take us. Well, if uh, I host the Phantom Fest. This is our second year. And if you'd be interested next year, maybe coming down bringing your stones, we'd love to have you down our way. Absolutely. We're going to take a ride sometime in the not too distant future. We'd stop down and visit you, and maybe we do a show, and and uh, you can hold a stone yourself. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Ooh wee. <laughs> yes. And well, I'd, I'd be very interested I get, in your. I don't get to Africa or Egypt much. <laughs> What's that? I said, I don't get to West Africa or Egypt or places like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's not many of them get to where you're at either. <laughs> well, that's, that's the truth. <laughs> How many Egyptians you had come through your town last week? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that everybody would talk about it if they were. Oh, my God. <laughs> They probably think it was one of the Mexicans that jumped across the line or something around here. That's right, that's right. They couldn't tell the difference between a Mexican and Egyptian and where you're at anyways, could they? No, no, they couldn't. Oh, Lord. <laughs> that's the reason why a lot of people don't like me in this area, because, you know, I'm open to everybody and everything, but a lot of people yeah. here are kind of closed-minded, and, yeah, it's it's strange. I, I, a lot of good people I, down there, though, I I believe a lot of good people down around you there too, aren't there? Oh yeah, they're great people, but they 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 only see one color, and that's unfortunate. People are afraid of things they don't understand, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's the truth. Well, can you tell us about your uh, website, uh, and also if anyone has any, you know, concerns, thoughts, comments, or questions they'd like to ask you, and how they can get in touch with you. Yeah, if you have any questions, you call me. Any complaints, give Rodney a call. <laughs> Don't worry, they do. <laughs> you ain't got yeah, that the now. Is... <laughs> <laughs> I need to tell him that. Huh? Yes, the yeah. site is ancientalienstones.com. Take a look at it. It's uh, got a lot of information my son has compa- compiled uh, about Nomali, about the show we're going to put on TV, and about the few stones that are available right now. To if you're an uh, individual out there who's really motivated to be involved in this, check it out. And if you do have a stone and want to send me a picture, I'd love to see it. And uh, I'm right here, Ben awesome. at AncientAlienStones.com. Awesome, well, Ben. I appreciate it so much you coming on the show. I've I've had a great time, and and thanks for sharing, you know your your collection with the stones and your and your uh, thoughts and expertise. Thank you for having us on, and thank you for putting the word of Nomali out to your circle of people. Uh, you're, very, you're, you're, you're very welcome, and, I, and I'll, if you want to, uh, door's always open. You, you want to come back on, got something else you want to talk about, or you want to talk about more about your stones, just give me a holler. You got it, my friend. Okay, bud. Well, you have a great night, and y'all have a great weekend. Great to meet you. Many blessings. Hey, you too, sir. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Well, I want to thank Ben for coming on the show. Great guest. Nothing but respect for him and, you know, the work he's doing. Uh, Like I said, we welcome him back anytime. Next Thursday night, August 15th, our special guest would be published author, cartoonist, and podcaster, Mark Anthony Rhines. So everyone, like I said, have a great night. Uh, Have a safe weekend. And nothing but love. Until next week, bye-bye. Let's make sure I push the right one. I always forget which one it is.
That's it for us tonight. I want to thank everyone that took the time to listen in. I'd like to give a big shout out to the Vibe Radio Network and to Ryan for putting up with us. Also to all the first responders and our men and women in the armed services. Thank you for your service and the sacrifices that you and your families make every day to keep our great nation safe. Tune in next week to another exciting show starting at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Everyone can go to our Facebook page within the chaos and don't forget to like our page uh, to see upcoming guests along with past shows, postings, or you can also go to uh, my website at www.blackdiamondps.org or blogtalkradio.com forward slash vibe radio network. Also, we have a YouTube channel, so go to YouTube. Look up Within the Chaos for past shows. Thanks again. Until next week, everyone have a safe weekend and have a good night. And love you all. Be careful out there. I don't want to be an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful. We have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent, and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass, and dictators die, and the power they took from the people will return to the people, and so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, or what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men, with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines, you are not cattle, you are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate, only the unloved hate, the unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, 
Don't fight for slavery. Fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke, it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man nor a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines. The power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world, that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite!